Prophet said, I was sent to perfect noble character. Innama, according to the Arabic language, is called Adatul Hasri. It means the only reason I was sent was to perfect noble character. How do we do that? There are two primary concerns in Islam. The first and foremost is the heart itself, which is called Al-Qalb. It's also called Al-Aqal, Al-Fu'ad, Al-Sir, Al-Ruh. It has many names in the Quran. But primarily and foremost, it's called the Qalb. And the basis of the importance of the Qalb is in a verse of the Quran and in a Sahih Hadith. The verse of the Quran says, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُوا مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ On that day, on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah, nothing will benefit the human being except the one who brings a sound heart. In other words, the only thing that's going to benefit you, it will not be your wealth, nor will it be your children, which was the jahili concept of what benefited you in the dunya. In the Akhirah, suddenly the criterion changes. It's no longer a dunya we criterion, it's a ukhrawi criterion, and that is a sound heart. If you do not have a sound heart, then you better get one. If you do not have a sound heart, salamat al-qalb. And if we're backbiting, that's a sign we don't have a sound heart. If we're cheating, we don't have a good heart. If we're not fulfilling the obligations that Allah has commanded us to fulfill, we don't have a good heart. All of the things that distance us from Allah are indications that the heart has work to be done. That is the first and foremost concern of the human being is his own heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inna sam'a wal basara wal fu'ada kullu ula'ika kana anhu mas'ula. The sound itself, the sight itself, and the heart itself, all of them man has been made responsible for. Allah begins with hearing because hearing is the most difficult to guard. I came into New York City, and I'll tell you something, going from Mecca to Jeddah was like going from paradise to the gates of paradise. Going from Jeddah to Morocco was like going to a place where I could see paradise off in the distance, but I definitely wasn't in it. And then getting to New York was like a descent into the bowels of hell. And there's no exaggeration about that. Because suddenly, everybody around me was using foul language. Uh, it's unbelievable. The only time they don't use foul language is if they're serving you something. Everybody, I was standing in the, waiting for the bus. And I hear this pe two people talking and I, I wanted to plug my ears. And that's what Imam al awzai used to do when he saw people of Bid'ah. And these people, it was so foul, every other word was a foul language. And the mu'min is, laysa bi bidah in the hadith, the mu'min does not use foul language. Nor should he hear it. You have to protect it because now those words ring in the heart. They ring. They have a resonance because you're hearing filth. And it, you get polluted by it. So you have to guard the ears. And the problem, the danger of the ear is that it, it's, it's, it's aural. It's circular. It's not linear. The eye, you can divert your gaze. If you see something haram, you can look away. Allah has given the ability with the ear. And this is why in the Quran, Allah always mentions the ear first. Because the ear is more difficult. And the ear is a faster and more direct line to the heart than the, than, than the eye itself. And then you have to guard the eye because the eye is a mirror. It's a window into the heart. The eye is a window into the heart. But first and foremost, the heart itself is more important than anything else that the human being has been given. And so we have to purify our hearts. And now I'm based on Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi's uh, methodology, which is the methodology of the Messenger of Allah. This is how we do it. And it's not difficult and it's not complicated. The second most important thing is the limbs. So you have the heart and the limbs. This is our concern as human beings. Al-Jawarih. The heart and the limbs. You have to guard your limbs. How do you guard your limbs? Listen to the hadith. According to the hadith, every morning, all of the limbs shake in the presence of the tongue. 
and they say, Ya Lisan, ittaqillah fina, in a'wajajta, a'wajajna, when astaqamta, astaqamna, O oh, tongue, fear Allah concerning us. If you're straight, we're all straight. And if you go crooked, we all go crooked. Because the tongue is called tarjuman al-qalb. The tongue is the interpreter of the heart. And the tongue is the most dangerous organ in the destruction of the human being. And this is why the Messenger of Allah said, are people dragged on their faces and their noses or their noses in the hellfire other than the harvest of their tongues? Other than the harvest of their tongues. Our Messenger of Allah, upon him prayers and peace, said, if you guarantee for me what is between your two thighs and your two jaws, I will guarantee you for you paradise. If you guarantee for me what is between your two thighs and your two jaws, I will guarantee for you paradise. And this is Ifa concerning the bestial nature of man, in other words, it's purity of our bestial nature, which is to, to explore our human sexuality in areas that Allah has permitted it and to avoid areas that are impermissible. And then it is to honor our angelic nature, which is the ability to articulate, which raises us above the beast. Because we are called, according to the Arab scholars, al-insan al-natiq, al-haywan al-natiq, the articulating animal. This is the gift. Ar-Rahman. Allama al-Quran. Khalaq al-Insan. Allama al-Bayan. The merciful taught the Quran, created the human being, and then gave him Bayan, the ability to speak and understand, which is the basis of understanding and interpreting the Quran. Now, concerning the heart, there are only two concerns. The heart has only two concerns. The first is belief, i'tiqat. What do we believe? Because the heart is the source of our belief. It's where we believe from. When I say uh, my heart's not in it, it means I don't believe in it. Right? I don't have the, the certitude to give my life for it. Belief is in the heart. And this is why the Messenger of Allah said, A taqwa ha huna wa ashara ira sadrihi thalath marrat. Taqwa, which is awareness of Allah, is here. And he indicated his heart, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So belief, now belief is easy. In the sense, the outwardness of it is not difficult. The mustashriq, the orientalist, can learn the outward nature of Islam. They can understand it. You can learn aqidah in a short period of time. You can learn it on a weekend. And this is not an exaggeration because our, our tradition is not a difficult tradition. It's a tradition that the Messenger of Allah could teach to people on a visit. They used to make wufu, they would come to him and, and they would spend only a short time with the Messenger of Allah and he would teach them Tawheed and then he would send them off. And it was not an exaggeration what I mentioned about Shaykh Marab al Hajj saying that Tawheed is contained in Ikhlas because it really is. If you understand Ikhlas in a deep way, you understand Tawheed. I'tiqad is not difficult. Iman is when the belief becomes a conviction. You see, in other words, when the, the creedal formulation that we've learned becomes something that we're willing to die for. And this is something very profound. Because like Imam al-Busiri said in his Hamziyyah, إِذَا حَلَّتَ الْهِدَايَةُ قَلْبًا نَشِطَتْ فِي الْعِبَادَةِ الْعَضَاءُ When guidance penetrates the heart, suddenly the limbs respond in worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the, 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 the profundity of, of, of conviction that Allah is true, that Allah's messenger is true, that the Jannah is true, that the Naar is true, the Sirat is true. All of these things are haqq. They're true, they're haqq. They're from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're real. And one of the most profound realities of this tradition and this is something I've only come to realize, one of the most profound realities of this tradition is unlike all of the other peoples on the earth, or at least the vast majority of the peoples on the earth, the Arabian Peninsula, at the time that the Messenger of Allah came to it, had a unique aspect to its belief system. They did not believe that there was anything after death. The vast majority of human societies believe in some form 
of life after death. The native uh, peoples of this continent believed in this. The traditional African peoples believed in that. The Europeans believed in it. The Druidic people believed in it. Even the ancient Greeks with their Hades believed in an afterlife. Dark and despairing as it was, they believed in an afterlife. The Chinese believed in an afterlife. In Pure Land Buddhism, they believe in an afterlife, reunited with the great Buddhas of the past. The Indians believed in an afterlife. The Arabians did not believe in the Ba'ath. مَا هِيَ إِلَّا حَيَاتُنَا الدُّنْيَا وَمَا نَحْنُ بِمَبْعُثِينَ it's only the life of this world, and we will not be resurrected. Who will bring dead and decaying bones to life after they've died? Say the one who brought them back the first time. So this is something extraordinary. How is it that the Quran, we have not examined the Quran. As an ummah, we have a romantic attachment to the Quran. Most of us say, oh, the Quran, what a great book, and have never even read it. They've never read it, right? We're like people in the restaurant who look at the menu for 50 years and never order to taste the food. We just look at the headlines, right? Right, you go into the restaurant and, and it says uh, shish kebab, and you don't even know what that is. And you just look at it and stare at it. And, the, and the, the garçon comes to the table and says, would you like to take your order? I'm still thinking about it, right? Really, that's what we're like. We're like people that have never bothered to taste the food that Allah has given us. Food for thought, right? Food for thought. The Quran, and this is why this romantic attachment to Islam is a flimsy attachment. It's an attachment that leads to extremities. It's an attachment that leads to passion when one is impassioned. And passion, as every ancient Arab knows, is something that is incompatible with the intellect. Like uh, in the story Imam al-Qushayri mentions about the Usfur, there was a sparrow on the top of Suleiman's uh, place of worship, and he was trying to convince a female sparrow that he was a worthy mate and she wasn't paying any attention. This is a story. And he said, you know, if I wanted, I'd, I'd turn this dome right over on the head of Suleiman for you. And so Suleiman, who knew the, السلام, who knew the interpretation of the birds, called him down. And he comes down, he's all shaking and his little sparrow heart's beating. And he says, Suleiman says to him, what, what made you say that ridiculous remark? And the sparrow said, Oh, Prophet of Allah, don't you know that lovers are never taken into account for what they say in the presence of their beloved? Right? In other words, I was in a state of passion. You can't take me to account. And, and this is the reality of, you see, we have, we have these passionate displays. In fact, there was something somebody told me about. I didn't see this, but there was a demonstration. I think it was in Canada. And they fought. The Muslims were fighting over who was going to lead the demonstration against the bombing of Iraq. Right? This is a disease of the heart. It's called hubriyasa, love of leadership. I, I'm the leader. I'm the spokesman here. Really, it's a disease. And, and I'll tell you something about this age. This is an age. It's a leaderless age. It is a leaderless age. Because the one prerequisite of leadership is not there. And that is that you don't desire it. Because if you desire it according to the hadith, you're not allowed to have it. We don't give al amr liman yatlubuhu aw yahrus alayh. We don't give this affair, meaning ruler, governance, leadership, to anyone who seeks it or covets it once he obtains it. That gives an end to election day. It's over. Right? Vote for me. That is the sign that you shouldn't vote for him. The, seriously, the only, the only, he was a, a, a frightening military leader, but the only leader that the Americans probably ever should have had uh, was Sherman, Tecumseh Sherman, who said when he was asked to run for president, he said no. If, if, if nominated, 
I, I wouldn't run. And if elected, I wouldn't rule. That sign there is a sign that that should be the man that they should put forward. Not the man saying, vote for me, right? I, I, I'm, the, I'm the proper ruler. I can help you out. That's the man he can't help you out because he's too busy seeking power, right? Really, he's, it's a disease in the heart. They, they, they love it. They want to, they, this is why that man couldn't, he couldn't step down. This man can't step down. He couldn't even dignify the American people by resigning before this whole thing came out. Just be a dignified human being and say, I made a mistake and it was a mistake that makes me unworthy to be the moral leader of the United States. Because the president is also considered the moral leader. They understand that concept within their own tradition. He's incapable because his moral flaws are too great. Right? We, we can't, if, a, uh, if an imam did something like that, that's it, it's over. You know, he'll have to come into the masjid if he comes in with his head bowed down and never say another word in public because he's been disgraced. And you don't want that person put forward as, a, as an example. In fact, one of the things they noted in the newspapers was after that scandal, suddenly the use of foul and descriptive language became commonplace in all of their major newspapers. Things that young people are reading, the children are reading, and suddenly these things are belittled. And this is the destruction of the moral fiber of the society, whatever's left of it. There's not much left, right? It's, it's like whole wheat uh, bread and white bread. Right? Seriously, there's no brand there. There's no moral fiber. It's gone. It's junk food. Right? You have junk souls. And that's, and that's really, this is a serious crisis. And like Sidi Muhammad Shri said, we have the religion that can transform these people and make them great people because these people, not only the Canadians, but the North Americans in general, have the potential for greatness. They have the potential and we have to recognize that. They have worked wonders in the world. And if they would transform their energies and make it for the sake of Allah instead of the sake of dunya, they would work wonders for Islam. And we should desire their guidance. We should desire their guidance. We, sh we should not, really, we should not desire their destruction. We should desire their guidance. We should desire the destruction of the worst elements of that society that is corrupting the best elements of it. Because there are evil people. And th there are. We have to deal with that. Re that is a reality in our tradition. There are evil people with evil ideas and evil thoughts. And they set out to corrupt the hearts of human beings.